right. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, my name is John Mary, um, and today we're going to talk about the actor model. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, so uh, just kind of a, a roadmap for where we're going to, how we're going to talk today. We're going to start with some theory. I'm going to introduce it kind of in the abstract. Um, then we're going to look at some practical usage, uh, have some uh, live coding I'm going to do, so you know, look forward to that. Um, and at the end, I'll have some resources if you're, you're still interested after the talk, um, you can kind of go and, and learn more. Um, and just before we, we really get into it, just so you know that the actor model isn't this, this real abstract concept. It is something that after this talk today, if you're interested in, you can go, you know, whatever your favorite language is, and you can, you know, write some stuff in an actor model. So these are just some popular ones. There's Erlang and Elixir, uh, was kind of one of the first real productionalized versions of the actor model. Um, Akka, if you're on the JVM, you want to do Java and Scala. Um, Orleans for .NET. A uh, fun fact about Orleans is actually the Halo multiplayer backend was written, on, written in Orleans. So, um, you know, it's kind of cool. And then, you know, there's other languages like C++, Ruby, Python, whatever your favorite language is. If it's, you know, moderately popular, you're probably going to find uh, some sort of actor model implementation. Okay, so just jumping right in, um, you know, what is an actor model, right? Just a pretty basic definition here is it's a method of concurrency in which the universal primitive is going to be the actor, right? So what do I mean universal primitive, right? So if we take, take a look at like threads, a threading model, uh, the thread is the universal primitive, right? So if you have multiple threads, then you have concurrency. So here in the actor model, it's kind of the same thing. If we have multiple actors, then we have concurrency. Right? And just so you know, there were not, there's not just threads and, and actors and processes. There's other types of concurrency models. So there's, you know, futures, which are gaining popularity, coroutines. There's uh, CSP style languages. So if you're looking at like Golang, you're going to have those kind of semantics. And there's, there's a ton of others. So if you, you know, get on Wikipedia and search around, it, it's not very hard to find a, a bunch of different actor models. And it's definitely something you, or sorry, a bunch of different concurrency models. And it's definitely something that's, that's worth doing. All right. So jump right in. What are actors? Right, we'll kind of know what this is, but what, what are actors in the actor model? Right, and let's look at some properties of an actor. Uh, the first one, which is interesting, is that actors are persistent. Right, so this is different than, say, a thread or a process or a future. Like when I start a thread, um, when it's done doing whatever work I've given it to do, it, it dies, right? Unless it does some weird blocking thing, right? And the same for a future. I give a future and I give it, I give it some unit of, of code to execute. When it finishes executing, the future exits. It, it no longer exists. In an actor, an actor model, an actor, this is, this is different. When I create an actor, whether it's doing something or not, it still exists, right? And it exists until either I, I tell it to stop existing, I shut it down, um, or there's some sort of exception or crash or failure that causes it to, to no longer exist. Um, the next thing that's interesting is that it encapsulates internal state, right? So this is, not all concurrency models have internal state. So if you think futures, right? Futures don't really have state. Right? Threads can, can kind of have state if you have like thread local stuff. Coroutines have state, right? And, and actors have state as well. Um, they also encapsulate it, which means that there, are, there has to be some sort of semantics for how we access and, and, and modify that data, which we'll see in a little bit. Um, we kind of already mentioned actors are asynchronous, right? So you have multiple actors, you have concurrency. So it makes sense that they're asynchronous. All right, so what can actors do? All right, first and foremost, they can create new actors. Right, this makes sense, right? When I have a, a threaded application, it doesn't make sense if my main thread can't create more threads. Right, so this is the, kind of the first fundamental property. Um, interestingly, they can, they can receive messages, and this is where we kind of get into the meat of it, and in response to that, they can make local decisions. Right, so this is how we kind of get to that local state. We alter that local state. Um, they can perform any sort of arbitrary side affecting action. Maybe they're writing to a database. Maybe they're you know, writing to a log file anything that affects the kind of the global state of your application. They can send messages, right? So they can send messages to, to other actors, um, and they can respond to the sender zero or more times. Right? Now, this is interesting because this differs a little bit from your typical kind of procedural model where if you, you call a function, you're going to get nothing back or you get, you get one thing back. With actors, I could, I could send a message, and that actor would respond with you know, possibly no messages or one message like we'd usually expect, but I could also get five messages, ten messages. I could get an infinite number of messages. Right? So this kind of is interesting in terms of how we, we work with the actor model. Um, and then lastly, we process exactly one message at a time, right? So if you send an actor multiple messages, they're going to go into this kind of mailbox thing, this queue that we're going to see more of later, and it's just going to process one message off the queue at a time. So this means that within an actor, we don't have additional concurrency, right, if we're talking just a pure actor model. 
Okay, and this is a something I stole from the Effective Go website um, or web page, but it, it applies pretty well here to actors as well. In that we we don't want to um, we don't want to communicate by sharing memory, right? This is very typical of like a threaded model. We want to instead share memory by communicating. This means we want to build everything on top of this this message passing paradigm. Okay, so I want to jump into an example. We've kind of seen a little bit about actors as. Um, but let's let's get some concrete. So I'm going to use the kind of a very classic example you've probably all seen in school or online somewhere. Where we're going to have a checking account. Um, we're going to try to perform multiple simultaneous withdrawals on this checking account, and we're going to require some sort of coordination to ensure that we don't overdraw the account. And we can assume here that overdrawing the account is going to be an invalid state for us. Um, so just to give some some concrete details, we're going to have a balance of eighty dollars. We have two people, person A and person B. Uh, the one wants to withdraw 60, the other one wants to withdraw 50. We can see here that, you know, one has to succeed and one has to fail, otherwise we're going to have an overdrawn account and that's invalid. So a basic example, a naive approach, right, is that we just have this checking struct and, you know, we have the simple if condition, right, if the balance is greater than the withdrawal amount, um, decrement the balance return true. Returning true means here that we've successfully withdrawn the amount of money we wanted, um, and we we're successful. Otherwise, we return false, so you know you failed. Now, what does this actually look like? So, in a single threaded approach, right, or in a single one thread concurrency, we're going to have person A. You know, they're going to get the balance, get back eighty dollars. They're going to perform that check. That check is going to be the if condition we saw earlier, right? If you have enough money, and if we have enough money, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get the balance again, update it, um, and then store it back. So that's that decrement operation, that that minus equal operation, expand it out. Now, once we introduce a, another person, we can see that things are already getting pretty complicated, right? Um, both person A and person B retrieve the balance. They both get back $80, right? Because they're both doing it at the exact same time. This means that they both pass that if condition check and they both attempt to update the balance at the same time. In this case, person A wins. They update the balance first. But person B has already done the check. They've already said, yeah, there's enough money in the checking account. And then they perform an update again, right? We end up storing back a negative balance. And we can end up doing a lot of different combinations here. Um, and we could get a bunch of different invalid states, right? So if we, you know, we're taking a typical approach, we'd say, okay, well, let's introduce some sort of lock. So we introduce this mutex, you know, line six, we, we lock it, right? Um, from then on, we do the normal function we saw before, right? And we, once we get the lock, we know that we're the only one in the, that particular area of code. Uh, we perform our withdrawal and we free the lock, right? We return success. So this ensures that only one person is going to be updating at a time. Okay, problem solved. But, I mean, what this buys us, while it is correct, it does get a little more complicated, right? In the real world, things are, are not so simple. Um, you may involve getting multiple locks. You may have to get the locks within a certain order. There can be deadlock conditions. And any new person who comes along in your code base, you have to make sure they know kind of what they're doing and they don't cause some sort of race condition in your code that can be really hard to track down. Now let's look at this from an actor perspective, right? So we're going to define that this checking actor is going to have a balance of, of $80. Um, we're going to define this receive method. So this is kind of like we're looking for incoming messages. In this case, we're looking for an incoming message of a withdrawal in some sort of amount. And then we do the, the typical naive approach, right? We check to make sure we have enough in the balance, we update the balance, and we, we send a message back of true or false. Right, the only thing really different here is the fact that this is in an actor, and instead of saying return, we say send a message. Right? And, you know, if we were to call the code, we'd say checking send message 50 and 60. Assuming we sent these at the same time, we get um, a sequence diagram that looks like this, right? So both, both person A and person B send a message. They go into the mailbox, right? This is this thing that sits in front of the actor. This is the queue. Um, from then, the checking actor is going to process one message at a time, right? That's one of our, one of our properties, our rules. Um, so we go ahead and process it. This is going to go ahead and you know, update the balance, perform the decrement, and send back a message, say, yep, you're good to go. Um, then we're going to process the next message. Obviously, there's not enough money. We're going to fail. We're going to send a message back of false. Right? This gives us the same correctness as the locking example with the difference that no one can mess this up. Right? If a new person comes along, they just send a message. Right? They, can't, they can't access that actor's internal state, so they can't kind of go around us um, and cause some sort of race condition. Right? And, you know, this is very simple. This is easy, you know, to understand. The example we saw is easy to understand. And, you know, we get really happy developers. You don't have to worry about locking and race conditions. Okay, so we've seen, we've seen actors. Um, we saw a very short example. Um, and we saw that communication was really important, right? We, so we, do, we kind of base everything on sending messages, sending and receiving messages. 
So we need to define some properties of communication to understand the actor model fully. The first is that actors don't use any sort of channels or intermediaries, such as a CSB style language. You know, if we think Golang, you, know, you may have a channel you share between two Go routines, and it's going to include semantics on that channel, such as, you know, if it's bidirectional or, you know, unidirectional, um, you may have types on the channel, may have things like, you know, guaranteed delivery or buffer, things like that. Um, actors don't have any of that, right? It's, it's a very, very simple form of communication. And because of that, they're going to give you what's called a best effort delivery. This means that you know, whatever protocol they're using to send the message, whether you know, if, it's, if it's within the same process and there's some you know, internal protocol your framework uses, if it's across the machine, maybe it's TCP or UDP or maybe a you know, socket, um, whatever that protocol says, if the protocol says, yeah, the message was sent, this was a success, we're good to go, then the actor model says, cool, right, I trust you. And that's what they call best effort delivery. Right, so from this we can see we're going to get at most once delivery because the actor model is not going to do any sort of timeout. It's not going to do a retry. It's not going to do anything other than what the underlying protocol says was valid. If the underlying protocol happens to be UDP, then obviously you, know, you may not get it at all. So that's why we have the at most once delivery. Um, messages can take arbitrarily long to be delivered. Right? Now this is in part because the actor model, uh, in, in the theoretical sense, doesn't have a concept of time. Right? There is, there's, no, there's no timeout, there's no times. So it makes sense that if I send a message and there's some DNS wonkiness and it gets sent you know, halfway around the world just to get to a server that's within the same rack, then within the actor model's point of view, theoretically speaking, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and there's no message ordering guarantees. Right? So we can kind of see because, because we already do best effort and there are no timeouts and messages can take arbitrarily long to be delivered, we can kind of see that that kind of like leads us and kind of forces us into this next point that we can't make ordering guarantees. Right, because we can't, we don't know where messages went. We don't, you know, we don't track them. Um, there's no, there's no timeouts. Mm. Right. Okay. So the next important thing is an address. Um, now, an address I, identifies an actor. So if we think of like a web service, right? So you know, some you know, Gmail.com, right? That is an address that identifies um, a web service, right? So in the same way, you have uh, addresses that identify actors. Um, they may also represent a proxy or a forwarder to an actor. It's kind of the same thing. If I go to gmail.com, it's very, uh, very unlikely um, that I'm going to get one specific server every single time. All right, what am I going to get? I'm going to get some sort of load balancer, proxy, forwarder that will eventually get me to a Gmail server. Right? So the same is true of actors. An, an address may not represent a single actor. It may be some sort of proxy or load balancer. Um, the address is going to contain location and transport information. All right, so think, once again, just keep thinking web service addresses. The, the DNS or the, the DNS address or the, uh, the IP address, that's going to be the location information, uh, maybe a port, right? The, the transport information is going to be the protocol you're using. Maybe it's TCP, maybe it's UDP, um, et cetera. And what this gives us is, is location transparency, right? I don't really care where the actor lives. As long as I can send it a message and that, that address has all the information about where it needs to be delivered, that, that's great. That means that I can have an actor in the same process. I can have the actor on a different machine, uh, you know, different process on the same machine, but the, the communication protocol and the semantics for how I communicate within an actor system, with an actor model, are completely the same across all of them. All right, so this gives us some really interesting ideas about how we would, would scale a system from one machine to multiple machines, because the, the way we send messages doesn't change. Now, I kind of already mentioned this, so one address can represent many actors, right? So we have a load balancer, we have some actors um, in that address, you know. Right? One address can represent many actors. Um, similarly, uh, one actor can have many addresses, right? So we have an actor in the same process, different process, different machine, right? A, a, B, and C, they're all pointing to that actor in the middle, right? So it's all the same actor they're pointing to, but they're all using a different address to access that actor. Okay, so we have, uh, we have these actors. Um, they, they exist. They're, you know, they're, whether they're, they're processing messages or not, they're persistent. Um, messages can take arbitrarily long to be delivered. How do we know when, they, when there's a failure, right? How do we know it's not just taking a while or the message is delayed? Like, how do we know when something goes wrong? Uh, and the answer is supervision. And supervision is when the running state of an actor is monitored or managed by the supervisor, which in practice is typically just another actor, right? And so what is this supervision? Right? So supervision, like I said, it constantly monitors the running state of an actor. Right? Is it processing messages? Has it stalled? Has it hit an exception that it doesn't quite know how to handle? Right? It can perform actions based on the state of the actor. Right? Was, was there an unhandled error? 
right? If the actor hits an inhale there, maybe it's just like, oh, I don't know what to do, supervisor, you know, what should I do? And the supervisor can then take action on that actor, right? So maybe it's just like, you know what, like you messed up, just start over, maybe it'll go better this time, right? That'd be great. So, but then the question arises, okay, well, who supervises the supervisor? Right, and we kind of get the supervision trees, right? We can kind of think of this like an organizational structure within a, within a corporation, right? You have managers, and your managers have managers, and they have managers, and so on and so forth. And each, each manager knows how to, you know, manage their direct reports, and, right? And they're managed by their manager. So you kind of get these, these trees. And at the top, you usually have something in practice that's kind of this magical thing provided by the framework that, did, that never dies, and you don't really have to worry about it. It just kind of, you know, has some default behavior for how it handles uh, and, you know, exceptions or unhandled errors at the top level. And so this, this supervision, uh, along with what we saw with addresses, gives us a transparent lifecycle management, right? So there's a couple of points to note, right? Addresses don't change during restarts. That makes sense, right? You restart your web server, your address doesn't change. DNS doesn't change. That would be terrible, right? And your mailboxes are persisted outside of the actor instances, right? So we can't talk about this mailbox being this queue in front of the actor. And we kind of have something like this, right? So the address encapsulates kind of the mailbox and the actor, right? Messages flow through the address into the mailbox. The actor processes messages off the mailbox and responds, you know, however, it, however, you know, it's defined. If that actor instance has an issue, the supervisor can just say, oh, well, you know, continue processing, ignore whatever issue you came across. It could even just say, you know what, I'm gonna just kill that actor and I'm gonna replace a whole new actor, new, whole new actor instance, and just kind of shove it in there. Into the outside world, this is completely transparent, right? Because you're sending messages into the mailbox, the mailbox is still there, it still exists, right? And the actor, even it, it could be replaced and you would never know. Right? Okay. So actor use cases, right? When when is it a good idea to use actors? Right? The first one is when you have some sort of like processing pipeline. Right? And this kind of builds on the fact that actors are are based on these uh, messages that they kind of, you know, they take in a message, they do some processing, they push out a message, right? You can see how that just having that basic kind of set up, you can dynamically create these processing pipelines with different actors and dynamically compose them to create a processing pipeline. And along with that, you kind of have this idea of, of streaming data, um, right? So you're, you're reacting based on messages. Um, you can possibly, you know, you could filter things because you don't have to necessarily respond to every message you receive. You could, you know, create more messages for you can know, like process streaming data. You can you know decompact streaming data by sending out more messages than you receive. You can do a lot of stuff in that way. And a lot of systems like uh, like Spark are kind of built on the idea, uh, you know, around kind of like actors. They just don't use actors directly. Um, Multi-user concurrency. This this one's an interesting one. This one's probably my favorite one because it's just kind of cool. So this plays on the idea that actors are persistent. So let's say you have a gambling website, right? User logs in. They want to they spend some money. Um, you know, they'll, they'll probably lose some money too. Hopefully they'll, they'll lose more than they spend if you're running you know, a profitable website. Um, and you want, to, you want to track how much money they're making and spending, kind of like we saw with that checking account earlier. Right? You want it to be transactional. Um, you definitely want to make sure you're, you're safe about it. You don't want to erase conditions when you're talking about money. Um, so what you can do is you can create an actor when the user logs in. This actor kind of represents the user in your system and it exists for the entire session or lifetime that that user's logged in. And then any actions that they perform uh, within your, you know, your gambling website will all be represented through messages that are sent to their actor that exists during their session. So this is updating how much money they, they you know, spend and make. And this allows us to kind of handle this all transactionally, but also in, in a very, very scalable way. Right? So we're not relying on like one centralized database to do this for us. Um, another interesting one is systems with high uptime requirements, right? Now this, this plays on the, the concept we saw earlier where, um, you know, restarts and lifecycle management can all be kind of transparent to the user, right? to, the, to the person talking to the actor. Um, and this allows us to build systems that, you know, are kind of self-healing, right? If there's an error, um, the supervision kind of kicks in, handles the error, restarts the actor, and it, it keeps us from having some sort of exception that we may not expect from bubbling all the way up and, you know, crashing your application. Um, Ericsson is, so they're the people who wrote Erlang, and they're, they're a telecommunications company. They build uh, network nodes, um, and the, the, the story goes that, you know, they were trying to find a language that would kind of give them this really high uptime. Um, they ended up kind of building their own language, and they've, re they've, reported, they've reported nine nines of uptime, including planned downtime for their network nodes. Um, and in part, they, can, they attribute that success to Erlang. 
um, and its ability to, to handle failure in a very graceful way. Um, and then we have applications with a shared state, right? So we kind of saw this with a checking example, right? If you have shared state, actors are a fantastic way to wrap that shared state and be very safe about how you access it. Okay, so I'm going to talk through a little bit of an example here with, with batch job processing. So this is something that we had a while back at AppNexus where our clients were like, you know, we, you know, through the API, we can create campaigns and creatives, and that's all great. But I want to create like 5,000 campaigns at once, right? And I want it to be really simple. I just want to give you like a big blob of JSON. So here's 5,000 campaigns. Go off and, and create them. Come back. Tell me, you know, how did this go, right? So we kind of des designed a system to look, look kind of like this, right? You have this HTTP actor, right? Every circle is kind of an actor that would push into this, this queue actor, which would then distribute jobs among these, these kind of bulk processing actors. Like they process these giant bulk jobs, right? So a request comes in, like I said, it goes to the queue. You know, the queue is basically just kind of doling out work, right, as, uh, as we have actors available. The bulk processing actor then has this giant job. It's like, okay, I got to process this giant job. And then we have these, uh, so it has its own pool, these small job processors, and it, they're each doing this kind of one thing, creating one campaign, creating one creative in our advertising system. Um, and the, the bulk processor just keeps track of all this, right? It's very stateful. It's like, you know, what, you know, what have we done? What succeeded? What percentage are we at in completing the job, right? This is all information that can be reported back. Um, then, you know, once we're done, the, the bulk, a uh, processing actor can just respond directly to the HTTP actor and we can send our results back to our client or perform whatever action we want. Um, in this sort of system, um, you know, not only just allowed us to kind of define this, this abstract flow, you know, data flow through our system very, very easily using actors, it also allowed us to control the level of concurrency that we, we wanted to support, right? So our system wouldn't become overloaded. Um, all the actors kind of use this like push-pull so we have back pressure and, um, you know, the whole system won't be overwhelmed. If we want to support uh, more throughput in the system, we can add more instances or, you know, up the level of concurrency that our application is using. Okay, so time to do a little bit demo. I'm going to do a little bit of live coding. Hopefully it doesn't go uh, terribly. Um, so this is a little bit of a... Um, kind of contrived example, but just want to let you know, see a little bit of what it looks like to, um, to program within the actor model. Um, so I'm going to be using ACA, which is one of the implementations I showed in the beginning, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to create an actor, and it's going to basically, given a range of numbers, it's going to return back what, what were the prime numbers within this range. Right? Okay, so let's say we're going to say val uh, prime finder, Right, and this is going to be a new actor. We're going to create this new, this new act. Um, and we're going to go ahead and define the behavior, right? So this is where we say, this is where we look for the incoming messages. So I'm going to look for an incoming message of a range, right? Um, and then based on that range, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to process it, right? I'm going to return something. Um, but that range could be a really large range of numbers, right? It could be, it could be 1 through 10, or it could be like 1 through a million. So in this case, I may want to take advantage of the fact that I can create a worker pool to control the level of concurrency um, that I want to, to use. So we'll go up here and we'll say, uh, oops, not bad, we'll say worker pool, and we're going to create a list of actors, right? Um, and then we'll say, okay, well, when the prime finder actor starts, I want to go ahead and start my, my actor pool as well. So we'll say, uh, when starting, right, we'll define some actions to run. We'll say uh, one to five. We'll create five workers. Uh, and we'll loop through here. Whoops. And for each of these, we'll do the same thing we did with the prime uh, actor. So we'll say val worker actor equals actor. And then we'll say context. That's just something that's uh, you know, particular to the, the ACA system here. And we'll make the same kind of, you know, look for the, the messages. In this case, we're looking for messages. They're just going to be an int, right? We're not actually, we're not going to process a range. We're just going to process one int value. And we have a simple thing here. We're going to say, you know, if the value is prime, right, then I want to send a message. Now, the exclamation point here is, is ACA uh, semantics for tell, right? I'm telling another actor. I'm sending a message. So I'm sending a message back to the sender, 
and I'm going to send them a, a two-tuple pair here. Um, so this is going to be the value that we received and true. So true is, you know, yes, uh, we found a prime number. All right, so we've defined our worker. So down here we can just say uh, worker pool, and we're going to just append the uh, worker actor that we created to the pool. All right, cool. So we have our workers, we have our worker pool. Now down here, I kind of left this blank. What are we going to do when we, re we receive a range? All right. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to define our workers. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just taking our worker pool and turning it into kind of an infinite iterator. So it's kind of like a, a circular array. So when we get to the end, we'll just go back to the beginning. Um, and then I'm going to say range. I'm going to iterate through the range. And for each number, I'm just going to say workers dot next, and I'm going to send it the number. OK, so we've sent all the numbers off to, to our, our worker actors, um, but they're sending information back, right? They're sending that message back of either, you know, I, I found something, and it, you know, this is what's prime, or it's not sending back anything at all, right? So down here, we just need to look for another message, right? So we'll make another case, and we'll say, this time we're going to receive a value that's an int and a true, right? That's how we know that uh, what they found is prime, and we're just going to call out a print line uh, and say, yeah, you know, that's the value that was found. All right? So fairly simple, but you can kind of see like how we're sending messages. All right? Okay. So we've defined the prime finder actor. Right? We've defined it. It exists. Right? It's persistent, like we've seen, but we haven't actually sent it a message. <laughs> All right? So if we want it to actually do anything other than just exist, we need to send it a message. So if I go in here and I say uh, prime finder, I'm going to send it a message, and I'm going to send it 1 to 100, right? So this is, I'm creating a range of 1 to 100, sending it to the actor, and it should print out and tell me uh, what was found. So let's go over here. Um, should we all see this? Just make sure this compiles real quick. It compiles. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and start this, and we're done. All right, so we can see uh, it printed out all the lists of prime numbers. Uh, from 1 to 100, and you can see that it didn't quite show up in the order that we, we sent, you know, the order that the range is, right, because you have five actors processing at once, so you get them a little out of order. We got, you know, 3, 2, 5, 1, 7, you know, a little bit out of order. All right, cool. So that's kind of the demo. Um, now, you've kind of seen what actors are. We've, we've seen some of the use cases for when they're useful. We've had a, a demo. It was a, it was a little contrived demo. Um, but you know, what are the anti-use cases, right? When do you not want to use an actor system? When is it not appropriate? Well, the first is the, probably the silliest one. That's when you're working in a system where you can't have concurrency. Right? That makes sense. Don't use, don't use features, don't use threads, don't use, don't use actors, right? Because they, they are concurrent. Um, when you have performance critical applications, right? Now, this isn't to say that actors can't be fast, right? A lot of actor implementations are very fast. But it's important to note that they are an abstraction, right? They exist on top of processes and threads and servers, right? If, if you have you know, a very performance critical, applic critical application and you need, you need very fine control over the threads that are running, how they're running, um, maybe you need to kind of interrupt processes or, you know, at certain times because you have, you know, a, a, a very, you know, tight latency window that you need to be in, then actors are not going to solve that problem, right? They abstract all that information away from you and you usually don't have a whole lot of say depending on the implementation, about how those actors actually execute. Um, the next is when there's non-concurrent communication involved, and I'm going to pair this with, and there's no mutable state. Right? So let's actually, I'm going to explain this one with an example. Right? So we have this actor, foo, it's going to receive some request, and then within that it's going to make a database query, um, and then based on the result of that database query, it's going to get some value from Redis. And we can assume that the database query and the Redis operation both are going to be blocking operations, right? So, and we also notice that this actor has no state, right? Essentially what we've done is if we created this actor and we sent it a bunch of messages, like 10 messages, then we would essentially get really no concurrency because each one of those messages is going to be processed one at a time and we're not really gaining anything because we don't have any shared state that we're, you know, that we're accessing over. So there's, there's no real reason to use an actor here. Right, I could create a pool of actors, right? kind of like we do with our example, but like I said, the example is a little contrived. Um, we could create a pool of actors, and, and maybe that would, that would get us what we wanted, but 
there's, there's also better approaches, right? In this case, a future is actually probably more appropriate to use. Futures are stateless. When I create a future, if I call this method five times, then I get five futures, and that means I have five, you know, threads of execution or, you know, parallelism of, of however many futures I create, right? Okay, so if you're going to use an actor system, what are some of the drawbacks that you need to be aware of, right? Um, the first one is going to be too many actors, right? Now, now, maybe you can't have too many kittens, but you can certainly have too many actors. Right? Now, there are some people out there who are a little actor crazy who will be like, you know, if you turned an object-oriented system into an actor, actor system, then every, every class should be an actor. Right? And that, that's a little extreme because, like I said, actors are, are asynchronous. Actors rely on message you know, passing. So tracing that and understanding that when you have so many actors can be really kind of hard to see you know, what's going on, how they're composed, and it just gets a little difficult. And this kind of leads into testing, right? When you have so many actors and they're sending so many messages and all these actors are, you know, possibly stateful, right? Things can get really hard to test, right? How do you know you're testing the right actor? How do you know you're not testing, you know, a bunch of downstream actors because of messages that might get sent? Um, additionally, you know, since actors are concurrent, right? You, you typically, in practice, need some sort of test kit to test them, right? You don't want to introduce things like, like sleep, you know, thread sleeps and timing-based things into your testing because that's terrible. Um, so, you know, ACA, for example, has an ACA test kit, which allows you to test actors, uh, you know, a, which, in a way that appears to be synchronous, right? So definitely take into account testing when, you, when you're building a system with actors. Um, and the, the last one is debugging, right? Debugging uh, can, be, can be difficult anyways, right? Anytime you introduce um, state with concurrency, um, that can be a, a bit difficult. Um, but it's important to note that actors don't really solve that problem, right? State and concurrency are always together, are always going to be difficult to debug. Um, and then also, if you're debugging in production, and say you open up like top, right? You want to see what processes are running. Maybe one of them is going crazy. Maybe you want to see the threads running on your machine. What you're not going to see are actors, right? You're not going to see what actors going crazy. You're going to see what threads going crazy. And because I already said that actors are an abstraction over top of, of threads and processes, if, you know, you look at a thread going crazy, maybe you take a thread dump because you're hoping to see what actor's going crazy. By the time you've done that, the thread may have moved, the actor may have moved to a different thread because the scheduler is like, oh, this thread's too, you know, congested. I'm moving this actor over, right? And things can get a, a little, a little hairy. Um, all right, so if I haven't scared you away, too much. There, there, are, there are additional resources. These slides are going to be on my GitHub, so you can click all these links and, and go look at them. Um, the, my two favorite are the actually ones at the bottom, <laughs> which is uh, don't use actors for concurrency. Right? This is, is it's kind of a provocative title, but it's really just um, when to use actors and when not to use actors. And it's a, it's a pretty good discussion. The other one is, you know, why has the actor model not succeeded? Um, I, I obviously disagree with this one, but um, it is from its older post from 97, and it does make some pretty interesting points when you're talking about running um, actors in production and, you know, kind of some performance uh, concerns there. Um, and then, obviously, there's, so there's some books and, and stuff that you can read and some talks that are pretty good. Um, ACA in production is from the Pacific Northwest uh, Scala Conference, and it's a really good talk about them building a large-scale metric system and doing a lot of kind of streaming stuff with ACA. Um, and then... Uh, you know, Twitter, email, and GitHub. If you, your questions don't get answered today, um, you can hit me up on any of those. And then that GitHub is where the, uh, the repo for the, the actor um, slides this talk is. is. Um, yeah, so if we have any questions, and sorry, I didn't mention this earlier. If we have any questions, um, we have someone with a mic uh, running around. So if you just raise your hand and you can talk whatever. I think we have someone already in the middle back there. I'll just be pleasantly walking. I'm not really <laughs> going to run. It's time. So uh, you mentioned uh, actors for pipelines. I use Scala. Uh, is there any advantage of actors for pipelines on, that aren't solved by ACA's own streaming engine, for example, because it has a much higher level interface. And from my experience with actors, it's exactly what you said. It's a little bit hard to follow up what's happening. Mm -hmm. Is there any advantage of using ACA? And the second question is uh, about persistence. Uh, what happens is an actor dies, for example. The information of the state of the actor, can it be recovered, or is it lost completely, or how does that happen? 
Okay. So the first question about streaming, I don't think I've used the, the Scala streams enough to really know. Um, the, the main benefit with ACA is just being able to compose different actors together. Um, if you can do the same semantics with streaming, then, then I would say that streaming is probably maybe a little bit better um, in terms of, of formulating that. Um, and then the, what was the second question? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, actors dying. Okay, so if an actor dies, um, we already saw that the mailbox will stay, right? Because it exists like outside the actor. Um, the, the internal state of the actor itself, um, in the pure actor model, I don't think it actually describes what will happen to that state. Um, I know for, for some frameworks, like ACA has persistent actors, which will, will tr attempt to, um, to keep that state if the actor restarts, and I think it does like some snapshotting stuff. So that may be more of an implementation specific thing. Um, from what I've seen in most actor systems, the default behavior, if an actor um, uh, hits an exception and is restarted, is it, it actually loses the state. And a lot of that is, is based on the idea that that state might have actually been the problem that caused the issue. Um, because if you were in, in, and it's the same reason like in, in ACA, for example, I'm not sure about other implementations, if you have an exception on a particular message, that message will not be replayed against the actor when it's restarted. Because it, it might have been that message that, that that caused the issue, right? And it's up to the supervisor to determine if it's the message plus the state that caused the issue, because the supervisor might just say, ignore the exception, continue processing, or the supervisor might say, restart the actor instance, right? So it was a little unclear to me when you were talking about message passing between the supervisor and the actor, where the responsibility falls. Is the supervisor polling the actor for information about that internal state and its current processing, or is the actor responsible for notifying all supervisors? So it's, it's not that there's a direct communication relationship between the actor and the supervisor. There's usually some sort of, of special relationship between the two. Um, in, the, in, the case of, uh, in the case of ACA, right, for example, because I'm speaking from ACA a lot because that's my experience, is that when there's an exception, um, it's actually wrapped up and the, and the actual framework takes care of invoking the supervisor's kind of handler code. Um, so nothing ever, no, no exception kind of escapes the actor. Um, in other systems, there's, there's different ways of handling it that, you know, when an actor goes down, there's just kind of some default functionality by the framework where a message is sent to the supervisor that says, hey, this actor went down. Right, ACA has a similar concept where you can do what's called a death watch, which is you may not be supervising an actor, but you may care if it dies. Right? And you can kind of watch that actor if it, and if it dies and then you get a message to say, hey, this actor has been shut down. And you know, maybe based on the way you set up your application, the actor doesn't restart when it's been shut down. Right? And then you can perform some action based on that. So there's, there's different relationships. A lot of it's going to be dependent on how your framework is implemented. Um, the, actors, the actor model in general, uh, I don't think specifies a whole lot about the relationship between those two. But yeah. Um, one more in the, in the back and then... Okay, one more over there. Be farther away, huh? So, so I just want to know for Node.js developers, what does it mean? What does this model mean? Like, does it even is it like default Node.js? Is it the default model of Node.js? Yeah. Um. So. Like what? As a Node.js developer, what advantage would I gain? Sure. So. If you're talking Node.js, I mean, Node.js kind of has its own model for concurrency. I don't think it would quite fit into um, the, the actor model for concurrency because it doesn't, doesn't have that message passing kind of paradigm already. Um, in terms of in how it's applicable, to be honest, I'm not, not really sure how you would uh, apply it to, to JavaScript in general, especially a lot of JavaScript kind of being this like single threaded thing. Um, I, yeah, I'm not really sure, to be honest. If, if you want to talk to me more later after the talk, maybe we can, we can chat and, yeah. Is there a different tool chain that you use for uh, m monitoring and logging when your app is structured to use actors? Yeah, so there are, yeah, met metrics and, and tracing and, and debugging are, are difficult. There are different, um, tool sets out there that allow you to kind of instrument actors and see message flows through your system. Not a lot of them I've seen are real mature or that, that or they're either kind of a combination of different tools put together to, to service an actor 
model implementation specifically. Um, so it's definitely a challenge when you're doing actor models. Um, for ACA, there, there's one called, um, can I remember it? I don't know. There's a particular one for, uh, for actors in, in ACA that kind of helps trace a lot of information, but it's difficult, especially when you're looking at um, actors that span multiple servers. Then you have to trace that request across servers, and so you definitely need some really good metrics, but there's, there's nothing that I've seen that's really, really mature. Okay, uh, I think that's it, so I'll hand it back off to Ben.